Oh my god, okay, so this is definitely spring-loaded. It's the biggest spring event I think we've ever seen. Normally not much happens, but a lot happened at this one. Some great stuff, some terrible stuff, some more terrible stuff. My dreams were crushed. This is a living nightmare. I'm hoping to wake up at any moment. This is a dream, right? Let's talk about the spring-loaded event. All right, let's 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 get the good news out of the way first. So Apple Card family sharing. You're going to be able to add children and, and, and your spouses to the Apple Card and they can use it and build their credit score. This is good. Okay. There also wasn't Apple Podcasts Plus, like some people were expecting, where premium podcasts would be held behind a paywall. Apparently, they're just launching some features so that podcast creators will be able to build in a subscription tier to have a ad-free option or certain things might be able to be behind a paywall. It's a little bit confusing, but but it's not a TV Plus type service like Podcast Plus. It's more directly for podcasters to take advantage of, and we'll probably talk more about it on the Talos of Tech podcast that drops later tonight. But then, of course, AirTags are real. And I must say, while I don't care about the product itself, I am so incredibly grateful that AirTags are out. We know how much they cost. $29 for one, which was insanely lower than I was expecting. I did not think Apple would price it that low, but then it's a hundred dollars if you want to get four so the value of the air tags themselves are actually not that bad until you start looking at the accessories you have to get for them in order to put them on a keychain or put them on your backpack or on a bicycle or something of course they're going to have the ultra wideband chip and they have this new user interface that shows how easy it is to track items down giving you visual haptic and audible feedback all of that stuff is great and the price point was pretty reasonable but all of the accessories that they're trying to ship alongside air tags seem to be where a lot of the money is made. So they have some Hermes ones that are like $300, a literal keychain. Yeah, north of $300, but then some non-luxury ones that are like $35. And that's probably where Apple's planning on making a bunch of money are the accessories themselves that you put AirTags in. And the weird thing is they're not rechargeable. I was kind of not expecting Apple to do this, but the battery life of AirTags lasts about a year or a little bit over a year, according to the event. But then there is a user replaceable battery that you're going to have to take out and put in kind of like those old style watch batteries and I'm guessing you're going to have to buy those yourself or Apple's going to start selling them so long term they know probably every 13 to 15 months you're going to be buying a new battery to replace this with and they're not rechargeable so I kind of would have preferred having a weaker battery life that I could recharge that way I don't have to buy a new battery every year or so because that's kind of a turnoff for me but either way just the fact that you'll be able to buy them take them out of the box and there's no cable, no charger or anything, and you can just simply set them up and not have to charge them for over a year. That's pretty convenient and impressive. So I like that aspect. And also, hey, a new exclusive spring color. The iPhone 12 and 12 mini now come in Thanos phone purple. Didn't see that coming. I was not expecting more colors to launch. But yeah, if you want a purple iPhone 12 mini now, uh, they'll be available to order this Friday. Same with AirTags, by the way. At the moment, it doesn't seem like anything is available to order as of today, but you can play around with it on the Apple Store. But yeah, this Friday, Friday is when the AirTags in the new iPhone color are available. We also, of course, got new iPad Pros, which was almost a certainty going into this. The 11 inch iPad Pro luckily stays at the same price and ya boy guessed it. I made several videos about this and none of you believed me, but I was suggesting the M1 chip should go in the iPad Pro because it's a five nanometer design. It's super powerful. You don't need an A14X that's very similar to the M1. If it's so similar in performance, just call it M1. And that's exactly what they did. And of course, 5G modems is now an option. And all that. But Thunderbolt has also been brought to the Type-C port, so you can actually output a 6K resolution to the Pro Display XDR from your iPad. There's a new white smart keyboard option as well. And the good news, of course, is the iPad Pros still work with their older keyboard cases. So as long as you still have an 11-inch iPad Pro keyboard case or a 12.9-inch keyboard case, that will still work with the new iPads. No new standards to adopt to, which is great. And another great feature that I did not see coming with these new iPad Pros is a feature called Center Stage, which I'm actually a big fan of. So they put an insanely ultra wide camera on the front facing true depth camera system now, which is 122 degrees, very, very wide. And that means that when you're FaceTiming, it will actually motion track with you as you walk around. It's like panning between the ultra wide image so that if more people come in, it can track their faces and move around, even though the iPad itself is not moving, which is kind of amazing. So I could actually see myself taking advantage of features like center stage. So I'm glad they introduced that. And it was kind of a surprise. I didn't 
didn't see that coming. So very thankful for that upgrade on the iPad Pro front. And now they're even offering a two terabyte storage configuration. And this is the other speck of good news. The base model iPad Pros come with eight gigs of RAM now, but if you get an iPad Pro with a terabyte of storage or more, now it comes with 16 gigs of RAM. Granted, they are quite expensive. In fact, there are several iPad Pros that go well past $2,000 now, not counting the keyboard case. But yeah, it's awesome to finally see eight gigs of RAM and 16 gigs of RAM built into iPad Pros now. It's just lacking the software, okay? It's got the M1 chip. It's got eight to 16 gigs of RAM. It's got keyboard and trackpad support. Why can't Final Cut come to the iPad? It's so close, but I'm very happy with the hardware that they're shipping in this thing now. Having Thunderbolt is also gonna be really, really good for high transfer speeds now that we have two terabyte iPads available. Although the mini LED iPad Pro, yes, they're calling it Liquid Retina XDR, has some of the same specifications as the Pro Display XDR. So 1600 nits peak brightness. You've got a million to one contrast ratio, which is very close to the Super Retina HDR displays we have on the iPhone 12, except now they're 120 Hertz Pro Motion displays. Although it did come with a bit of a price hike for the 12.9 inch version. So the bigger iPad Pro now starts at $1,100. I thought that was a possibility given it was a new display technology. I figured this was gonna happen. It is a tad thicker, although it still works with the old smart keyboard case. So I'm happy about that. And I'm very curious to try it out knowing that we have an M1 chip built into an iPad now that's that thin and light and also has all the great camera features. It's got cellular, it's got 120 Hertz. It's got this amazing display. It sounds like an amazing all around product that's just going to be probably a bit more expensive than you were hoping. And yes, the new iPad Pro still come with 20 watt USB-C power adapters, which is kind of nice. Another thing I was really happy about during this event was the Siri remote. It feels like Apple watched my video and directly responded with it. They made an all aluminum design, so it's much easier to see. There's not a bunch of useless glass that's just gonna shatter. And they brought back the D-pad style clicker, but it's also still kind of a click wheel, like an iPod. So you can still scrub like you did on the old Siri remote and just use it like a trackpad. But if you're more old fashioned and just wanna use a clicker and just go up, down, left and right, you now have that option. And the Siri remote is capable of controlling your TV itself. So it can change volume, it can mute, and it can turn the TV on and off with a power button. You can also still charge it via lightning, which isn't my favorite charging method, but I like that they updated the Siri remote to be more functional, more practical, and probably going to handle old fashioned third party applications a lot better than the traditional Siri remote. However, I guess maybe now is a good time for me to start talking about things I don't like. They did update the Apple TV 4K, but not in a way that I thought was very interesting. So alongside the new Siri remote, they now have a A12 chip, just the A12 powering the Apple TV, which if you've seen the Geekbench scores, you know that the A12 is not really that different from the A10X Fusion chip they had in it beforehand. It's just a little bit faster in the CPU department, but with a television that's playing games and TV, CPU doesn't make a huge difference and GPU matters a bit more. And the GPU on the A12 and A10X are pretty close. In fact, I think there's a few tests where the A10X is actually a tad faster. So I'm not sure why they felt the need to update it with the A12. It's kind of a weird choice. And they also announced that the A12 chip will now be able to have like true tone on your TV where you can hold up your iPhone to the television and your iPhone will sync with your Apple TV and try to color balance it so that you can truly take advantage of Dolby Vision HDR footage that you airplay to the television. So basically by buying an Apple TV, they think the color accuracy of your TVs will get better. I, I kind of doubt how well it will actually be able to do that. And the most disappointing thing about the new Apple TV is the price and the storage configuration configurations did not change. It's still $180 for 32 gigs and $200 for 64 gigs. Way too expensive for a TV box in my opinion. And the Apple TV HD is still on the site for $150. Even though it has an A8 chip, it's still being charged 150 bucks and it can't do 4K, but it does ship with the updated Siri remote. So it appears they've completely scrapped the old Siri remote and they're going all in on this updated design, which I would say is the right call, but the prices on these Apple TV box, in my opinion, are, are very disappointing. They need to bring the price down and I was hoping that maybe switching to the A12 chip would have helped a bit with affordability perhaps because they're using the A12 chip on other iPhones and stuff but it, it didn't so Apple TV overall somewhat disappointing but I am happy with the remote itself getting updated the Apple TV 4k with the updated Siri remote will be able to order on April 30th and it won't ship until the second half of May so you're not ordering that this Friday but a week from this Friday okay now let's talk about what I hate the the most. You guys know, I've been talking about it forever. I could not stop thinking about the updated
upgraded iMac. I really, really, really wanted a redesigned iMac with no chin, thin bezels, basically just take an iPad Pro on a stick. And I was reading the rumors. I was reading the reports. I was getting so pumped for the 24 inch iMac. And then they showed it. I'm not joking here, guys. I legitimately don't know how they could have made it worse. This is my literal nightmare. First of all, you guys know how much I hated the Pixel because of the pointless chin. There wasn't even a logo on the chin, which I don't really like logos on chins in the first place because I'd rather just have a clean, you know, universal size bezel all the way around. Instead, they have the giant metal chin in these weird unsaturated colors and they took away the logo so the chin serves like no functional purpose. And on top of that, they changed the bezels to white. And on top of that, they got rid of this space gray or black color and just went all in on weird off colors of green, yellow, orange, pink, purple, blue, and silver. Oh my God. I hate this design so much, and I don't think it's going to grow on me. To be fair, okay, it, it still starts at $1,300, so this is somewhat affordable, but it kind of makes sense when you consider that this is still rocking an M1 chip. I was really excited for new Macs, mostly because I wanted to see an M1X of some kind. I wanted to see Apple Silicon get taken to the next level. That's not what happened here. They did not give the M1X to the iMac. It's the same chip that's been in the Mac Mini and the MacBook Air since November, and because it's still the M1 chip, the base model model at $1,300 kind of has terrible I.O. On the back, there's only two Thunderbolt ports, no SD card slot, no Ethernet. Oh, actually, to get Ethernet, you have to spend more on the $1,500 configuration, and the Ethernet port is built into the power adapter. They've redesigned the power connector on the back of the iMac to be magnetic, and also on the more expensive iMacs, the power adapter includes an Ethernet port, so you don't have to route Ethernet to the computer. You can route it to the power supply. Kind of weird, but yeah, that's that base model only has 256 gigs of storage and eight gigabytes of unified memory. It's a 24 inch display. So they did technically slim down the bezels a little bit. It's a 4.5K resolution. So it's a bit over 4K. And the base model comes with a standard keyboard, which appears to have been redesigned. But yeah, basically all of the cool features are on the higher end model that starts at $1,500 for again, 256 gigs of storage. But now you get two extra Thunderbolt ports, but they're not actually Thunderbolt ports. They're USB 3. So they're traditional slow chargers, not super high data speed, but they are still type C. So they look similar to Thunderbolt 4. But at the end of the day, if you want that high bandwidth, high frame rate or high resolution monitor, there's still only two Thunderbolt ports to choose from. And that one comes with a magic keyboard that actually has touch ID built into it, which I thought was pretty cool. The keyboards themselves match with the colors the iMacs come with. And I honestly am not a big fan of these lighter tones. Even the magic mouse and magic trackpads got new color options, but yeah, the Magic Mouse still charges via lightning. They did not change that. Everything is still charging via lightning. You just can now have Touch ID on a keyboard, which is pretty sweet. And honestly, I would buy that for my iMac Pro now, except it doesn't seem that they are willing to sell the Touch ID keyboard separately. So I could be wrong on this, but so far it appears that the only way to get a Magic Keyboard with Touch ID is if you buy the new iMac. You cannot at this time buy that separately, which is a shame because I would really, really like to, but they they, they don't have it yet. No words on pricing of those updated mice or keyboards or anything. They're just coming with the iMacs and that's the only way to get them. Hopefully they start selling those separately because I wouldn't mind buying a keyboard that had Touch ID built into it just so I could have a biometric that works pretty well with my iMac. But end of the day, I use the Apple Watch to unlock it most of the time anyway. So not a huge feature request, but overall uh, the iMacs are a big disappointment. I mean, the speakers are better. They gave it a 1080p webcam finally. So it's the same kind of webcam that's been on the 27 inch iMac and iMac Pro for a while. They gave it the three studio quality microphones that they've had on the higher end iMacs for a while now as well. They claim the speakers are about 50% louder, so it should sound better than before. But overall, like from the back, it's honestly not that bad. The back of the iMac looks okay, but the front, I just cannot get over how giant that chin is, how ugly the white bezels are, the colors they went with, I, I despise. And also the headphone jack is like on the side for some reason. I think they're so thin, they 
they can't find a way to put the headphone jack where the other type c ports are so they had to put them on the side which is definitely gonna look kind of weird when you're plugging in your headphones and stuff so just the fact that this is still rocking the m1 and we didn't get the m1x and simultaneously the design is so horrendous i am very very much disappointed with this iMac redesign and i was really really hoping for more of an ipad on a stick i was not thinking they were going to keep the chin but ditch the logo and make it just so horrendous from the front i've been staring at it while recording this the whole time and i legitimately just i cannot get over how ugly it is and as i'm looking through the tech specs right now it appears that the base model iMac the one that's 1300 dollars has the seven core gpu version of the m1 so it's the same kind of m1 that they put in the base model macbook air so it's like slightly worse with the m1 but it's still the m1 i guess that one is just slightly more binned as they say but overall the colors are not my thing and the design is not my thing they got wi-fi 6 at least but overall i just despise the chin i despise the white bezels i guess the price is pretty good and i've seen a few of you guys say that the imac doesn't look that bad and you're kind of interested but to me they just completely missed the mark on this one i think this was a very much botched interior seeing the updated imac alongside the rest of the mac lineup it sticks out like a sore thumb it doesn't go along with iphone design ipad design macbook design it doesn't look like it's the same company that made this thing especially from the front so i'm very annoyed and angry and i have no clue what my next mac purchase is going to be now because if i have to put up with a 32 inch version of that imac i don't think i want it I i'm gonna have to think of something else for my next mac so that one of course will be available to order if you do want it on april 30th so not this friday but a week from friday and then deliveries will be in the second half of may so we've got a little ways to go until reviews for those start dropping but anyway let me know what your favorite part of this event was what your least favorite part of this event was all that good stuff let me know down below this is your apple sheep here i'll see you guys in the next one why did they hate me <laughs>